kind of funny. And so a Sunday school teacher was teaching her class about the difference between right and wrong. All right, children, let's take another example, she said. If I were to get into a man's pocket book and take his billfold with all his money, what would I be? Little Johnny raises his hands and with a confident smile said, he blurts out, you'd be his wife. <laughs> now I want you to look, can you bring oh, up uh, that, that scripture again? I want you to look at verse number one. It says, to the angel of the churches in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, in our study last Wednesday, we learned there were two reasons. The, the, uh, first of all, it says the word of those who's, who hold the seven stars in his right hand. He said, when Jesus was explaining to John who they were, he said they were the seven angels, the seven pastors, or the seven bishops. Those are the interpretations. So depending on where you are on it, it could be, and I want to say this right now, how do you believe that every church actually has an angel watching over them? Now you say, how do you know that, Pastor? Well, let me just say this. It says this here in the Scripture. It says to the seven angels. But also as well, we see in ancient times, for example, the nation of Israel had a an angel that was guiding and directing them. In fact, it says in the book of Exodus... If you make this angel angry, he will bring destruction upon you. Now it's interesting that also as well in the book of Daniel, we find the angel Gabriel trying to come down to visit and give a message to Daniel, but he couldn't come for three weeks. And it says the prince of Persia was standing in the way, but Michael, the archangel, had to come down and together they defeated the prince of Persia. So that's where I get the idea, and scripture gets the idea, that there's an actual angel watching over a church. But also as well, if you look at some of the interpretations, it could be a pastor, it could be also as well a bishop. So I'm not here today to dispute your, your thoughts, I'm just simply explaining how scholars have interpreted that particular scripture. But it also says, then he says, to the seven golden lampstands. Now we do know from the book of Revelation, the last two verses of, verse of chapter 1, we know that this is the seven churches. And so today we're talking about the, the first church, which is the church of Ephesus. Okay, So he says there are seven things that he wants the church at Ephesus to know. Now that's where we are in the verse number two. He says, number one, I know your deeds. That's a very important thing to know. To know that whatever you are doing, God is watching. And as Christians, we don't have to worry about the sinful practices, especially if we simply practice 1 John 1 9. It's 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that a wonderful thing to stand upon? So if you have made sin this week, you've sinned. If what you have done is confessed it, said, God, here it is. With your help, I'm not going to do it again. And right now, in this moment, I'm going to receive your forgiveness. That forgiveness is unconditional. Isn't that wonderful? That's what I love about forgiveness. That's what I love about being a Christian. About the fact that if I sin, I can bring it before God. God instantaneously, immediately forgives us, and we can start all over again. Isn't that wonderful to know? It is absolutely. God says, I know your deeds. So as a Christian, you're not dealing with the things such as sin. But there are some things that you will be judged on. For example, your love. And not only the way that you love God, but the way that you love one another. We all know what it says in Matthew chapter 22, 37 to 4. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love our neighbor as ourselves. Do you know that God wants to get you to a place where you actually like yourself? When you look in the mirror and actually say, you know, really, that's not all that bad. 
Now, I want to tell you the difference between how men and women look at themselves in the mirror. A woman looks at herself in the mirror and says, hmm, I see that imperfection, that imperfection, that imperfection. The guy looks in the mirror and says, not bad. <laughs> you know? Well, most of us anyway. Okay? Well, you see, when you are loving the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, you learn to love yourself, and then what happens is as you learn to love yourself, God also enables you to love others. You cannot fully impact your world until you have learned what God has made you. Now, let me just... There's a phrase that is sticks in my craw, and I, I want to tell you what that phrase is. I hear people say, who I am in Christ. Have you heard that phrase? As if they had something to do with what happened in their lives. For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Amen? So I like to use a different phrase. It's not about me. It's about Him. So I like to say, who Christ is in me, right? And in fact, that's what Paul says, Christ in me, the hope of glory. So next time you hear someone say, who I am in Christ, fire back and say, listen, it's not who you are, it's who's Christ in you, amen? Because it's Christ that is conforming you into the image that God wants you to be, amen? amen. It's not your own self. You didn't decide one day to get saved, and then all of a sudden decide that through this process, you were going to become super Christian. Because I guarantee by the end of the day, you will... So what you need to do is you need Christ in you. Now he says simply this, I know your deeds. He says, I know your faithfulness. I know your obedience. I know your love. I know your compassion. I know that you tried to do the gifts and fruits of the Spirit. I know those things. And he says, I will reward you accordingly. I'm looking forward to that day, and I hope you as well. Because God is going to look at what you've done with your life. And my also prayer for you is that every day you'll get up and say, Lord, I want to be a blessing. How many like that old hymn? Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing. In my life may Jesus shine. That's a great song, isn't it? I hope that that's your prayer. That you will be a blessing. The second thing he says is, I see your hard work. He says, I know you've been working hard. Now the church at Ephesus was started in revival. In fact, Paul was the one who started the church in Ephesus. And what happened in the church of Ephesus was incredible. For example, in Acts chapter 19, the baptism of the Holy Spirit came upon the church in Ephesus. There were 12 elders there, right? In the, that same place, they had book burnings and Satan worship was being destroyed. It was an on-fire church. All right? He says, I know your hard work. And that's wonderful. He says, keep working for me. There's an old phrase that uh, I like. It says, Jesus is coming. Look busy. Well, I'm just not talking about look busy, but get busy. Amen? He says, I know your hard work. I know that you've been reading your Bible. I know you've been praying. I know that you've been seeking the face of God. I know that you want revival. I know all of those things. I see them, and I commend you for them. He says also as well, your perseverance. How many know that this life as a Christian is not a hundred yard dash? It is a marathon. Did you know that a guy named Tom McGrath this week won, or last weekend, won the Edmonton Marathon? That guy came second last year. He is a local Edmontonian. He came number two in the Boston Marathon last year. Did you know that? He won the Edmonton Marathon. Do you know what he does? He works at a, at a, at a business out in Nusku. And he works from, uh, uh, what is it, 2.30 to, uh, to 11 o'clock? You know what he does every morning? Every single morning? He gets up and runs. And he runs 145 kilometers every week. Would you run 145 kilometers a week? Most well, you said, I wouldn't walk around the coffee table. But he does. What was the result of it? He won. But he does it through endurance and perseverance. I can guarantee that Mr. Tom McGrath gets tired. I'm sure that there are times where his body aches. And he says to himself, what in heaven's name am I doing this for? Have you ever felt that way? Of course you have. 
There have been times where you've been discouraged over what's happening in your life and situation. You see your family not getting saved. You see as well that from time to time physical infirmities come upon your life and situation. Your family and people are against you. There's all kinds of storms of life and you say, is it worth it? Jesus says, I see your perseverance. I see it. And then he says this, I also see that you do not tolerate wicked people. And you have claimed those who have been tested and are not, but have found them to be false. Now for a moment, I want to talk to you about how to test someone when it comes to that say. First of all, always, now listen, always check out by what someone says by the Word of God. Amen? If I am saying something that is not true, dispel it. Say, that's wrong. And even feel free to come and correct me if necessary. And then, if I, I will also come and re rebuttal you by giving you the scriptures where I, my position is. But let me just say this. The Word of God must be prominent. That's why we preach expository preaching here. Because we want you to hear the Word of God. So test it out by the Word of God. Secondly, what does the preacher have to say about Jesus? Last night, as I was out in my prayer time and I walked through Lions Park... I talked to this, I, I noticed that there was about 300 people there, and I walked up to this guy and he said to me, I, I said, who is this group? Oh, he says, we're the LDS. My heart broke. Why did my heart break? Because, folks, I was an LDS at one time. For two years, I went to a Mormon church. And I know exactly what they say about Jesus. They say that Jesus is the younger brother of Satan. That Satan was given the plan or the uh, opportunity for redemption. He turned it down and Jesus took it. That's what they say. They say that Jesus is a product of a sexual union between God the Father and Mary. And that God the Father is actually a human being. That's what they believe, folks. What you do with Jesus is absolutely important. Amen? That's why. You need to stand upon, thus saith the word of the Lord. We know what the Bible says about Jesus. It says that Jesus was 100% man, 100% God. Amen? God with the face, the incarnation, the perfect union of God and man. He was virgin born. That's what is all about Jesus. Jesus is the only way, the truth, and life. Amen? Amen. Jesus is the only one that can give redemption to, kind, to mankind through His broken body and shed blood. You and I have redemption and victory, eternal abundant life. That's who we need to be preaching. Paul said, if anyone brings to you a message that is contrary to what I bring, he says, don't believe it. Test it out, folks. We are called to test to make sure that what we are hearing is absolutely correct. Walk in discernment and also as well, watch their lifestyle. Watch the lifestyle. Because sooner or later, lifestyle adds up. Does their character exhibit and glorify the Lord? Then he goes on to say this. You've tested them and have found them be fault. You have persevered and endured hardships in my name. That's the church at Ephesus. He says, you have endured hardship. It was tough to be a Christian in those days. You see, back in Paul's day, and in fact around the world, the prosperity gospel doesn't match. It's great in places like North America. It's great in places where there's prosperity. But what do you do when you live in Kenya and the, your, your, your home is a dirt hut? What do you do? When you can't get access to a doctor, you have to come to the church and say, Preacher, pray for me, otherwise I'm dead. Folks, I'll tell you something. Your faith changes when all of a sudden you're faced with an unreachable, unfathomable situation where if God does not answer, you're dead. Amen? You, that's, he says, I, you've endured hardship in my name. And then he closes off by saying, you've not grown weary. See, I love what Paul says in the book of Galatians. He says, you've not grown weary in well-doing. But in due season you have reaped a harvest. He says, you've not grown weary. Folks, how many get tired? Come on, be honest, you get tired. Sure you do. Last night, I was tired. I 
my routine is I usually try to read a book before I go to bed. I've been reading a book called This Present Darkness. It's all about angels and, and all that sort of stuff, right? I last about two pages every night. Why is that? I fall asleep just so quick. Why? Because I get up at 4 in the morning and go until about 10 o'clock at night. My wife calls me the ever-ready bunny. I was up this morning at 4 o'clock just like every other morning. Even got up yesterday morning at 5. Isn't that crazy? Saturday morning. I got up at 5. <laughs> I must be nuts. But you know what? You don't grow weary. Or you do grow weary, I should say, in that type of lifestyle. You get weary with the situations that you find. Do you feel yourself being weary right now? You feel weary from time to time? I'm sure you do. But you know something? In those moments, in those moments, God can strengthen you. Amen? In those moments, if you ask God to strengthen you, He will. Now, take us to the next slide, if you wouldn't mind there, for a moment there, Marvin. Yep. Bring it over. This one? Yeah, bring me to the next slide. I think there's okay, only the three scripture. slides there. Looks like hmm? there's only three slides there. Yeah, bring it over. Yeah, bring it down. Bring it down. <laughs> oh, oh, hallelujah. It disappeared. <laughs> It did, I'm yeah, sorry. There, it should be right in there someplace. It's not. Okay. No, not. Well, then I'll just have to read it along. It's not. If it comes up, uh, if you find it, that would be great. All right. He says this. He says, yet I have this against you. Can you imagine? They have had seven accommodation. But he says, this is what I have against you. He says, you have forsaken your first love. Now that must have hit John right between the eyes. Why did it hit John right between the eyes? Because John was their pastor. Did you know that before he went to the Isle of Patmos, according to tradition, he was the pastor of the church at Ephesus? Here you have somewhere between Paul and John, a church that was on fire, and then all of a sudden, what did they do? They had forgotten their first love. How did that happen? Well, folks, it can happen so easily. For example, you can stop reading your Bible. You just say, well, I'll, 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 I'll miss my reading of the Bible today because, you know, I'm busy. Never get too busy to read your Bible. Secondly, you stop praying. When you stop praying, that communication with God, you begin to see happen, things happen. Thirdly, you stop going to church. There's a lot of people who say, well, you know, I, I won't go to church this Sunday, you know, because I'm tired. And they know what happens. Before you know it, it's one Sunday after another Sunday after another Sunday. And before you know it, a month's gone. And you're wondering why it is that you're starting to accept things the way they are. You begin to wonder why it is that all of a sudden the things that, you know, you wouldn't tolerate at the beginning, all of a sudden you start tolerating. It's because you're slowly sipping away. I've only ever met one man who said to me, well, I made a decision to leave the Lord. The other people that I've met, they've just simply said, well, I just got busy. You know, busyness is not next to godliness, all right? In fact, busyness leads you away from godliness. You need those times where you're alone with God and say, God, I need that. And that's what happened. Or here's another thing that can happen. You get so busy in the things of God or busy in, in those type of things that you just kind of neglect the reading of your Bible. Neglect prayer. Let me tell you the story of James Robeson. How many have heard of James Robeson? James Robeson is an evangelist and has a ministry and has been in the ministry about 50 years. In the early 80s, he was so busy with his lifestyle. I mean, he was, he was going all over the place. He had his own plane. He was traveling all over the world preaching the gospel. But he was so busy, he didn't have time to pray. He'd get up in the morning and his assistants would say, Mr. Robinson, we have to be at this prayer meeting at this time. Okay, so off he goes, he gets dressed, gets his suit on, puts his hair in the right direction, and he's going off. And he said, I started off at 6 o'clock in the morning and I went to 11 o'clock at night. And he says, I never prayed, I never did anything. I was too busy. You know what happened to him? One day, he found himself looking at some pornography. And then, before you know it, he was watching and looking at pornography all the time. This was an evangelist that was worldwide. And then one day his wife found him with it. And she says, James, what are you doing? He says, well, it's only a picture. She says, James, how long have you been doing this? He 
he said, two years. James Robeson had an experience with his wife. It's amazing when you're caught how quickly you repent. It's amazing when all of a sudden your wife is looking at you and saying, what are you doing? James repented. He went before his leadership and said, this is what's been happening. They said, how did it happen, Mr. Robeson? He says, I haven't prayed in two years. What do you mean you haven't prayed in two years? God's anointing is upon you. He says, I've been relying on the anointing and the people who believe in me instead of God. You know what happened? He spent a month away meeting with God, meeting with people. And you know what? That made him accountable. And God set him straight. An, an evangelist of world caliber. It can happen, folks. You have to be always watching. He says, I know that you have forgotten your first love. It can happen, folks. It can happen in marriages. There are times in marriages where actually husbands and wives don't talk to each other. Has that happened to you? I'm not asking the question. I'm just, uh, you know, hypothetically. Okay? It can happen. You can get so busy in making a life, creating family, and all of those things that you can actually lose your first love. So he says, that's what I have against you. He says, but there is something that you can do. Now listen to the word of the Lord for just a moment. He says, what you need to do is repent. That word means to make a 180 right now. Okay? If you are driving, for example, to, you want to go, let's say, to Toronto, and you say to yourself, I'm going to go buy a Kingston, and you're in Winnipeg, I guarantee you're going the wrong direction. Why are you going the wrong direction? It's quite simple. Kingston is east of Toronto, and you are west. You're going the wrong direction. Amen? When you find yourself in a place where you are going the wrong direction, when you find things in your life that should not be there, do a 180. Repent. That means confess it. Say, God, here it is. God knows it. But you need to know it. And you need to do something about it. Secondly, say, Lord, with your help, I'm not going to do this again. <clears throat> because he says, the next thing you need to do is go back to the beginning. He says, go back to where you started from. That's what he's saying to you. I like that. I like to know that if all I have to do is turn around and go back to where I started from, that's where life will begin to get less complicated. That's what he said. He says, you've forgotten your first love. All I'm asking you to do is repent and go back to the beginning. Start all over again. Isn't that exciting? Isn't it exciting to know that as a Christian, that if you make a mistake, if you sin, if you find yourself off course, just simply go back to the beginning. Let me share a story from our lives. My wife and I, we had the privilege of being able to uh, live in the territories. How many know that the territories is a very big place? Sure it is. So one day, some friends of ours said, you need to go to Cameron Falls. You need to go and see these falls. I thought, that's wonderful. I'll go to Cameron Falls. And so we went to Cameron Falls. There was myself, Lois, and uh, our two little kids, Robbie and Rachel. All right? And Robbie was about four and a half and Rachel was about three. And they said, it's about a half an hour walk to the falls. I said, no problem. I'm an experienced woodman. So I thought. So here I am, about half an hour, 45 minutes, and I can hear the falls in the distance, but we're not getting any closer. So I'm thinking to myself, you know what? Why don't we take a shortcut across the bush? No problem. Guess what? Big problem. We're wandering around in the, in the woods there for two hours. And I'm thinking, I think we're lost. I said, honey, I think we're lost. She said, whatever gave you that idea? I said, what should we do? She said, well, I don't know. I said, you know what we should do? Let's turn around. So you know what we did? We turned around. And we went back to where we started. Now, we didn't get to the falls that day, but we got back to the van. Three and a half hours of wandering around in the woods. My kids were hungry. 
Fortunately, my wife was smarter than me, and she brought food. But you know what? We, we went back to where we were beginning. The next time, we didn't make the same mistake. All we missed was one little turn. But we found ourselves out in the middle. Of, you know what you need to do? When you find yourself lost, just go back to the beginning. Amen? Start again. That's what Jesus says. He says, you need to go back to where you are. Because what you don't repent, this is the reality. I will come to you and remove from you your lampstand from its place. But he says, this is what you have in your favor. Okay? Now, uh, you notice I just kind of skipped over that? Because it's fairly self-explanatory. If you do not repent, you're going to lose out with God. Amen? And I don't believe anybody here wants to see that happen in your life and situation. He says, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, Jesus will further expand the, the teachings of the Nicolaitans. But for, for the purpose, you're saying, what is a Nicolaitan? A Nicolaitan was someone who, practices, who practiced uh, the practices of Balaam. How many have heard of Balaam, the prophet of Pethel? Okay? He was the man that was given the responsibility of cursing the nation of Israel. He was asked by the king of Moab to come and curse them. He couldn't do it. But you know what he did do? He says, if you want Israel to sin, he says, get them to get involved with mixed marriages and get them involved in your lifestyle. What he was saying is, pollute their lives. That's why James says, in James 5, he says, you must avoid the pollution of the world. Actually, James 1, okay? You've got to keep that pollution out of your life. How many know that if you walk by a bunch of cigarette smoker people, that sooner or later, you're going to smell like them? It's just as simple as that, right? When you go outside and you're driving, let's say, for example, by the uh, Strathcona, and you're by Shewitt Park, there's that band of, of area just by the refineries that always stinks like sour gas, right? And you think to yourself, man, oh man, I wish they would clean that up. Well, the simple fact is, folks, that's pollution. And pollution has all kinds of ramifications with it. Amen? What we need to do is not get polluted by the world. And that's what the Nicolaitans were saying. They said, it's okay to do a little sin. How many know that a little sin will kill you? Okay? It's like saying, well, you know, a little ecstasy will be okay. You'll get a little bit of a buzz in your head. Right? It's okay to, you know, drink a little bit of alcohol and, and, and drink yourself, you know, oblivion every once in a while. Folks, it kills you. A little bit. It's not like Brill Cream or a little dabble, do ya? Sin will sooner or later take you someplace where you never thought you'd go. It'll make you into someone that you never thought you would be, and it will destroy you in ways that you never thought possible. That's why Jesus says, don't get into the practices of the Nicolaitans. He says, that you hate those practices, which I also hate. Then he says this in verse number 7, He who has, has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now these seven churches all have something good about them. They all have something bad about them. But this consistent phrase is there. Let Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. How many know that God is saying something to the church these days? He is saying all kinds of things. For example, he's telling the church to get ready. Now, I don't know where you sit on this whole blood moon and this uh, situation coming up. You know, they said that uh, a year ago, they said a, um, uh, a two-kilometer um, uh, asteroid was heading towards the Earth. Just this last week, NASA said, no, it's going to miss us. Aren't you glad that NASA said they were going to miss us? Hallelujah. So we're not going to be blown away by some... By some uh, Asteroid. Okay, so that's kind of nice to know. But folks, what we need to be doing is watching the signs around us. We need to be watching what's going on. For example, when you're driving down the Yellowhead, and you're traveling at 90 kilometers an hour, around 149th Street, 142nd Street, there's a sign that says, slow down to 70. 
And just to make sure that you slow down by the time you get to 142nd Street, guess what the city of Edmonton has done? They put a nice little camera up there. And if you're traveling over a certain speed limit, you're going to have a picture taken. And about two weeks later, you're going to have a nice little photo of your car and your license plate with a nice little addendum to it. It's called $102. I know, because it happened to me this spring. I thought, 4 o'clock in the morning? No problem! Guess what? Big problem. I found out that cameras don't have what we call on and off switches. They take your picture at any time. And then I got this nice little notice, and I'm going, wait a minute, I don't speed? Obviously, that morning I did. Because all I heard was a ploosh. And I looked around and said, where's that? And guess what? So now, when I go down the yellow head, when I see that sign, guess what I do? I slow down. Because the last thing I want to have is another $102 ticket. Okay? So, it's a good stopgap, isn't it? Simply what he's saying to you is this. He says, listen to what the Spirit is saying. The Spirit is saying something. He's saying something to you today. He'll say something to you tomorrow. How many believe the Holy Spirit can speak to you every day? You should. As a Christian, you should believe the Holy Spirit can speak to you. When you open the Word of God tomorrow morning, and you say, Holy Spirit, would you speak to me? And as you're reading, if you are open to the Holy Spirit, He will speak to you. When you're in your next prayer time, why don't you say, Holy Spirit, would you speak to me? And I guarantee He will speak to you. This morning, I was in my prayer time. And I, I know this lady. And we were talking. Uh, we, uh, and I just felt that I needed to send her a message by Facebook. And I did. I haven't got my response yet. But I believe that I'll get a response. And I believe, I hope it's the right response. But the point is, when you're in prayer... Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit will do that. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. You're the church. How many know that? Okay? It's not just, you know, a building. It's you. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're the church. You're the body of Christ. That's who you are. So listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. He says, to him who is an overcomer. I love that phrase. In this phrase it says to the victorious. But I love the phrase overcomer. That's why in this area I kind of like the King James Version. To the overcomer. To those who have battled through. Those who have refused to grow weary. Those who have stayed too, true to their first love. There is a reward coming to you. And we're closing with that reward. And also as well a sevenfold exhortation of how to become an overcomer. He says, I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of a God. Now that is a great promise when you think about it. You and I are going to be able to eat from the tree of life. That tree that Adam and Eve could not eat from, you're going to eat from. Isn't it great? I don't know what kind of fruit it's going to be. I'm kind of hoping that maybe it's a peach. Or maybe a pear. I like peaches and pears. But maybe it's going to be an apple. Or maybe it's going to be a fig. Maybe it's going to be a kumquat. Do kumquats come from trees? I don't know. Okay? Kiwis come from trees. Maybe it's a kiwi. I don't know what it is. All I know is that the Bible says in the last chapter of Revelation, it brings healing to the nations. Isn't that great? When you eat that tree, you're going to be healed. What a great promise from the Word of God. That's what He says. If you will overcome, if you will stay the course, if you refuse to grow weary, if you keep your eyes focused on Jesus like the old song says, you'll have the right to eat from the tree of life. What a great and marvelous promise, which is in the paradise of our God. Let me close off with the sevenfold exhortation to the overcomer. First of all, if you want to be an overcomer, number one, you have to have confidence that God's going to bring you through to victory. Amen? You've got to place your confidence in God. He's got a victory for you. Amen? But you've got to stand on that confidence. You've got to say, Lord, I know in my nor, nor is, is Texan, for in my spirit, I know that you're going to bring me through to victory. Number two, you must 
know that no weapon formed against you will prosper. That's what it says in Isaiah, right? When the enemy comes in like a flood, the book of Isaiah says what? He will raise up a standard against him. You're the standard, amen? You've got to know that no matter what the devil throws at your way, you are not going to be defeated. Number three, renew your mind. By renewing your mind, you'll prevent yourself from becoming overwhelmed by evil. That's why it says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. Then he goes on to say, don't be conformed, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you would know the perfect, acceptable will of God. You can know the acceptable, the perfect will of God. By renewing your mind. You say, how do I renew my mind? Read the word of God. Paul says in Ephesians that the Spirit or the Word washes your mind. Isn't that great? It's better than detergent. I mean, it's better than going into the shower. Or maybe you even put it this way. It's a spiritual shower. Because every time you read the Word of God, your mind is being renewed and cleansed. Why? Because you're not focusing anymore on the problem. You're focusing on the solution. Who's the solution? Jesus Christ. Amen? That's the marvelous thing. Number four, let the Holy Spirit renew you and become your outward strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. And every day He's going to remove me. He's going to give me the power. He's going to give me the anointing. He's going to give me the victory. I'm going to have the impartation, the wisdom, the clarity, the boldness that I'm going to need. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to give you. So let Him work in your life and situation. It's like the old song says, Holy Spirit... Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. We even sang that song this morning, Holy Spirit. Folks, we need Him in our lives and situations. Amen? He is the deposit in us. Also, as well, be confident in the outcome. You are going to win. I, I know you've heard this phrase, but we've all read the end of the book. And we win! Amen? Amen. We win! It doesn't look like it from time to time, but we win. So have confidence in the outcome. Maybe you are in a battle right now, but I love what Mark Lowry says. The thing came to pass. It didn't come to stay. Amen? There's a process, but on the other side, you will be victorious. Remember also who gives you the victory, right? It's Christ who gives you the victory. Don't think for a minute that you're going to be able to defeat the enemy. Don't think for a minute you're going to be able to take out the devil. Okay? You have the victory in Jesus Christ. And lastly, the recognition you'll receive as a victorious conqueror and overcomer. I am so looking forward to those that one phrase where Jesus says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. We need to become overcomers. Amen? Now, you say, Pastor, that's easy for you to say. You don't know my situation. You're right. I don't know your situation. But I know my God. Amen? I know that God can do this. Folks, we all live in the same world. We all find ourselves in different situations. But Peter says, don't think it's strange when you find yourself in fiery trials. You have those times from time to time. There is not a single person in this room who can walk into this area and say, Pastor, I haven't had a trial. I guarantee that in the last month you've had a trial. I can maybe even guarantee in the last week you've had a trial. I can absolutely, positively guarantee you that in the last year you've been in the valley of affliction. You've been in the place where you don't know where to go and what to do. But if you will put your trust in God, He will bring you through to victory. And many of you will stand today and say, Yes, Pastor, I've seen that. I've seen God do that. And I'm believing that He will continue to do that. Let's stand together as we close. Father, we thank You today for the message.